in the quiet neighbourhood of 10 Rillington Place, an unspeakable crime unfolds, shrouded in mystery. Timothy Evans and his pregnant wife Beryl move into a seemingly ordinary top floor flat. Little did they know the dark forces of deceit and murder lurk behind closed doors. This is the case of Timothy Evans and John Christie, which has a shocking twist. In this murder mystery, the line between victim and villain blurs, and justice hangs in the balance. How did Timothy Evans find himself in such a horrible situation? Was John Christie the friendly, innocent person he showed to the world? Was Timothy Evans' case a miscarriage of justice, or were there two killers living under the same roof? Let's take another look at the historic case of the Rollington Strangler at 10 Rollington Place. Sit back, relax and let's get started. Before we get into the details and events of this case, I thought we would look at the main characters and their backgrounds. Timothy John Evans was born on November the 20th, 1924 in Merthyr Tydfil, Glamorgan, Wales to Thomasina and Daniel. Evans had a difficult childhood as his father abandoned the family even before his birth. He and his older sister Eileen were raised by their mother who remarried a man named Herbert in September 1933. Evans struggled at school and had difficulty learning to speak. When he was eight years old, he developed an infection, tuberculosis varicosa, on his right foot. This forced him to miss classes at school in 1935, he moved to London along with his mother and stepfather and started working as a painter while attending school. In 1937, he returned to Merthyr Tidville where he worked briefly in the cold mines before resigning due to the problems caused by the bacterial infection on his right foot. In 1946, the family moved to St Mark's Road, Notting Hill, where he started to work as a delivery driver. Evans was basically illiterate. He could read simple passages in comics and newspapers, but he needed help to read long documents. In order to boost his self-esteem, he often made up stories about himself, which didn't help him. Everyone knew he was lying all the time. On April the 25th, 1946, Evans was fined 60 shillings for stealing a car and driving without a license. Timothy Evans married Beryl Susanna Thorley, on the 20th of September 1947. They actually met on a blind date earlier that year in January. At first, they lived with Timothy's family on St Mark's Road. Beryl was on very good terms with her in-laws and had a close relationship with Thomasina, Timothy's mother. But things changed when Beryl found out she was pregnant in 1948. They decided to move into a top floor flat at 10 Rillington Place in Ladbrook Grove area of Notting Hill. Their downstairs neighbours were John Christie and his wife Ethel Christie, who seemed to be like a very nice friendly couple. On the 10th of October 1948, their daughter Geraldine was born. Evans worked as a delivery person in London, trying to provide for his wife and daughter. Their living conditions were far from ideal. This version of Notting Hill was starkly different then to what it looks like now today. The area had endured heavy bombings during World War II and still bore the scars four years later. The building on their street, one single family residences, had been divided into cramped multiple unit dwellings. The Evans's flat had only two rooms. They didn't have any indoor plumbing. Coal gas provided light and residents shared a wash house in the backyard for their basic needs. They were constantly fighting and at each other's throats, having these angry quarrels, mostly about money. Beryl had trouble managing the family's finances. She was just 18. Meanwhile, Timothy had a drinking problem and alcohol didn't exactly help his already short temper. Their arguments were so loud that even the neighbors could hear and there were even times when things turned physical between them. John Reginald Christie, had a troubled upbringing and experienced abuse from his father and dominance from his mothers and sisters. As a child, he witnessed his grandfather's open coffin, which seemed to have had a lasting impact on him. Christie was intelligent and excelled in mathematics and algebra. 
he had an IQ of 128. He struggled socially and was not very well liked during his school years. After leaving school, Christy worked as an assistant movie projectionist. As he reached puberty, he developed a warped view of sexual intercourse, associating it with death, dominance and violent aggression. Christy was a hypochondriac and had hysteric tendencies, often exaggerating or faking illness for attention. During World War I, Christy served as a signalman and claimed to have been blinded by a mustard gas attack. However, there is no record to substantiate this claim. Christy's personal life was marked by dysfunction and infidelity. He married Ethel Waddington, but their marriage was troubled as he was impotent with her and slept with prostitutes. Rumors circulated that Ethel stayed with him out of fear. They eventually separated with Christy moving to London while Ethel lived with her relatives. Christie's criminal activities began in the early years of their marriage. He was convicted of various petty crimes, including theft and assault. Despite reconciling with his wife after a period of imprisonment, Christie did not change his behavior. He continued to use prostitutes to fulfill his increasingly violent sexual desires. In December 1938, Christie and his wife moved to 10 Rillington Place in Notting Hill. During World War II, he joined the police force but engaged in an affair with a woman from the police station, which ended when her husband discovered them together and beat Christy up. Overall, Christy's life was marked by a troubled upbringing, sexual dysfunction, criminal activities, and a disturbing obsession with violence and death. In 1949, Thomasina, Timothy's mother, found herself anxiously waiting to hear from Beryl. It had been weeks since she had received any word from her, which was highly unusual. Beryl was in regular contact with her in-laws, but now she seems to have disappeared without a trace. Thomasina was really starting to get worried. To make matters worse, Thomasina discovered her son Timothy had also vanished from London. He had returned to his hometown of Merthyr Tydfil in Wales and was staying with his aunt and uncle. This news came as a shock to Thomasina because Timothy hadn't said anything to her. She also learned that Timothy had just quit his job and sold off all their furniture before leaving. Furious and desperate for answers, Thomasina decided to take matters into her own hands. On November the 29th, 1949, she wrote a letter to her sister-in-law in Wales to tell her what was happening. She made it clear that she had not seen Beryl or her baby granddaughter for a month. She suspected Timothy was involved in some mystery and declared that she never wanted to see him again. Thomasina was ashamed of her son's actions. She was also sick and tired of people coming to her demanding the money he owed them. The next day, Timothy's aunt read Thomasina's letter to him during breakfast. The words struck him deeply and he knew he had to confront the situation. Determined to set things right, Timothy left his relative's house and made his way to Merthyr Tydfil police station. There he approached the detective and blurted out a shocking statement. I have killed my wife. The detective, taken aback, asked him to clarify. Timothy replied, I've put her down the drain. This is the first confession out of many, Timothy told the police. He said, Beryl found she was pregnant again. She became depressed and said they couldn't afford to have another baby. She insisted she had to have an abortion. However, abortion was illegal in Britain at that time. Timothy stated on the 7th of November, he met a man in a cafe who claimed he could help Beryl with pills. Desperate to help Beryl, Timothy accepted the pills and gave them to Beryl. When he returned from work the next day, he found, to his horror, that Beryl had died after taking the pills. In a state of panic, he hid her body in a drain near their front door, sold all the furniture, gave the baby to some unnamed caretaker and fled to Wales. The police in London were briefed and told to go and retrieve Beryl's body. After struggling with a manhole cover, they eventually needed three policemen just to get it open. It was just that heavy and not surprisingly, there was no evidence of a body. So back in Wales, Police told him there wasn't a body in the drain, so his story didn't add up. He changed his story and said 
it was actually his neighbour, John Reginald Christie, who had offered to perform the abortion. Timothy said Christie was a former doctor and had shown him a medical textbook as proof. Beryl insisted on going through with the procedure. When Timothy returned home from work on November the 8th, he was met by Christie, who informed him that the abortion had failed and Beryl had died from septic poisoning. Christie promised to dispose of Beryl's body and arranged for Geraldine's care, advising Timothy to sell their furniture and leave London. On December the 2nd, Timothy was transported to London while the police searched 10 Rillington Place. In the wash house, hidden behind timber boards, they made a grim discovery. The bodies of Beryl and Geraldine and a 16-week male fetus was found in an outdoor wash house. Beryl's body had been wrapped twice in a blanket and then a tablecloth. The post-mortem revealed that both mother and daughter had been strangled and that Beryl had been physically assaulted before her death, shown by facial bruising. The police interrogated him for hours and hours and hours. He then changed his story again. This time, he admitted that they had a fight over money and in a fit of rage, he had strangled Beryl with a rope. The following night, he repeated the act, this time taking the life of his innocent daughter. To hide this terrible deed, he had hidden their bodies in the empty middle flat before eventually moving them to the wash house. And thus, a tale of tragedy, desperation and unspeakable acts had unfolded in the gloomy corridors of 10 Rillington Place. The case would continue to unravel, revealing further details and prompting investigations. After his arrest, Timothy Evans immediately retracted his confessions, claiming that Christie done it. Police did not believe him and his trial began at the Old Bailey on January the 11th, 1950. Under British law at the time, Timothy could only be charged with one murder, so they charged him with the murder of Geraldine. Christie and his wife, Ethel, played vital roles as prosecution witnesses. Christie denied offering to abort Beryl's unborn child. He and his wife, Ethel, both testified to the couple's frequent fights and to hearing a loud thud coming from the Evans' flat the night of November the 8th, the last day Beryl and Geraldine were seen alive. Timothy testified that he only became aware of his daughter's death after the police told him. Asked why he had confessed to killing his family, Timothy said, When I found out my daughter was dead, I was upset and I didn't care what happened to me then. Evans revealed that he had confessed out of fear that the police would physically harm him if he did not comply. The defence attempted to portray Christie as the murderer, highlighting his criminal record which included convictions for theft and malicious wounding. But John Christie seemed as if he had reformed and his service as a special constable also impressed the jury. Why would a man like John Christie murder Beryl and Geraldine? It made no sense and he'd been a law-abiding citizen for 17 years. Evans, on the other hand, had changed his story several times. He had no credibility. He was a terrible witness on the stand. It seemed more likely that he murdered his wife and daughter in a fit of rage. At the end of the day, it came down to he said, she said, and the jury believed Christie's version of events. Evans' defense failed to provide any evidence or witnesses other than Evans. The trial lost three days and it took the jury just 40 minutes to find him guilty. Under the law, at that time, he was given the automatic death sentence and on March the 9th, 1950, Timothy Evans was hanged at Pentonville Prison, still maintaining his innocence. After the trial, the Christies returned to 10 Rellington Place. In the weeks leading up to Christmas in 1952, Ethel's sister received a surprising letter from her brother-in-law, John. He explained that Ethel was suffering from rheumatism and couldn't write. He mentioned that she was going to be on vacation soon, hoping it would improve her health. In March 1953, John Christie moved out of 10 Rillington Place. Three years after the execution of Timothy Evans, a new tenant named Beresford Brown moved into Christie's old residence. While renovating the kitchen, 
Brown discovered a closed door hidden behind some wallpaper, shining a light through the crack. He believed he sees a naked woman inside the wall. Alarmed, he contacted the police. Chief Superintendent Peter Beveridge and other officers, including Chief Inspector Percy Law and a pathologist, arrive at the scene. When the door is opened, they find the corpse of a woman sitting in the room, her back turned towards them. Another large object, wrapped in a blanket, is also present. The victim's body is partially dressed, wearing only a garter belt, stockings and a pulled-up sweater and jacket. The woman was strangled with a ligature and her wrists were tied with a handkerchief. The police focus on the other wrapped object in the cupboard and discover it to be another body positioned upside down with a head wrapped in a pillowcase. A third corpse is found beneath the second one, also upside down, with ankles tied using an electric cord. The bodies are taken to the mortuary and the police decide to conduct a more thorough search. They uncover loose floorboards in the parlour and find additional rubble. They discover yet another female corpse and leave it under police guard overnight, planning to return the following day to continue the search of the entire place. Further searches of the building and grounds reveal three additional bodies. Ethel Christie's body was found beneath the floorboards in the front room, while Ruth First and Muriel Edie were buried in shallow graves in a small back garden. Interestingly, Christie had used one of their thigh bones to support a trellis in the garden, which had gone unnoticed by the police in their previous searches. John Christie was subsequently arrested and confessed to killing all six women found in the former home, including Beryl Evans. He claimed that Beryl was suicidal due to her pregnancy. He described using a rubber tube connected to a coal jet in the apartment to gas her with carbon monoxide until she lost consciousness, after which he strangled her. However, he denied killing baby Geraldine. Christie was charged with the murder of his wife, Ethel, and went on trial in June 1953, pleading guilty but insane. The first victim, Ruth First, was a 21-year-old Austrian munitions worker who occasionally engaged in prostitution. Christie claimed to have met her in a snack bar and invited her to his home for sexual intercourse while his wife was away. He strangled her with a rope. He initially hid first body beneath the floorboards of his living room and later buried it in his backyard. While working at a radio factory in Acton, he met his second victim, Muriel Emilia Edie. On October 7, 1944, Christie invited Edie to his flat, promising her a special mixture that could help cure her bronchitis. In reality, the mixture was Friar's Balsam, used to mask the smell of domestic gas. While Edie was seated and breathing the mixture through a tube, Christie connected another tube to a gas tap, causing her to inhale the gas and lose consciousness. He proceeded to sexually assault and strangle Edie before burying her alongside first. On December the 14th, 1952, John Christie strangled his wife, Ethel, in bed. Ethel had not been seen in public for two days prior to her disappearance. Christie had resigned from his job on December the 6th and had been unemployed since then. To support himself, he sold Ethel's wedding ring and watch on December the 17th and emptied her bank account. Between January the 19th and March the 6th, 1953, John Christie murdered three more women at 10 Rillington Place. The victims were Kathleen Maloney, Rita Nelson and Hectorini McLennan. Maloney was a prostitute from the Ladbrook Grove area, while Nelson was visiting her sister and was six months pregnant. McLennan was living in London with her boyfriend, Alex Baker, whom Christie allowed to stay at his place while they were searching for accommodation. Christie met McLennan separately and convinced her to come to his flat, where he killed her. He then deceived Baker, claiming he hadn't seen McLennan and even helped him search for her. Christie used a modified gassing technique on his last three victims. He connected a rubber tube to a gas pipe in the kitchen, 
releasing gas into the room while his victims were seated. The gas made them drowsy and then he strangled them with a rope. Chris also engaged in sexual acts with his victims while they were unconscious or dying, leading to allegations of necrophilia. It can't be confirmed whether he specifically targeted them after death. After strangling each victim, he placed a cloth between their legs, wrapped their semi-naked bodies in blankets and hid them in a small alcove behind a kitchen wall. He then covered the entrance with wallpaper. His trial began on the 22nd of June, 1953, in the same court in which Evans had been tried three years earlier. Christie pleaded insanity. The jury rejected Christie's plea and after deliberating for 85 minutes, found him guilty. He was sentenced to death by Mr Justice Finnamore. Christie was hanged at 9am on the 15th of July, 1953, at H.M. Prison, Penteville. His executioner was Albert Pierpoint, who had hanged Evans. Apparently, Christie complained that his nose itched. Pierpoint assured him, it won't bother you for long. After the execution, Christie's body was buried in an unmarked grave within the precincts of the prison. As was standard practice for executed prisoners in the United Kingdom. After Christie's conviction, doubts were raised about the fairness of Evans' trial and the possibility that an innocent person had been executed. An inquiry led by John Scott Henderson was commissioned by the Home Secretary to investigate the matter. Henderson concluded that Evans was guilty of both murders and Christie's confessions were unreliable. However, the controversy persisted, with ongoing debates in Parliament and media campaigns questioning Evans' innocence. Another inquiry, chaired by Sir Daniel Brabin, was conducted to re-examine the evidence. Brabin concluded that Evans was likely responsible for his wife's murder but not his daughter's, for which Christie was responsible. Brabin also acknowledged that the uncertainty in the case would have prevented a jury from being convinced beyond reasonable doubt of Evans' guilt if a retrial had taken place. Based on Brabham's findings, the Home Secretary recommended a posthumous pardon for Evans, which was granted. Evans' remains were exhumed and reburied, and his case contributed to the suspension and eventual abolition of capital punishment in the United Kingdom. In 2003, Evans' half-sister and sister received compensation from the Home Office for the miscarriage of justice in his trial. The independent assessor for the Home Office acknowledged that Evans' conviction and execution were wrongful, with no evidence implicating in his wife's murder, which was most likely committed by Christie. This is a list of just a few discrepancies found in the inquiry. A timesheet of Evans went missing after it was handed into the police. It would have given Evans an alibi. The workers, plasterer and carpenter gave witness statements, but it wasn't presented during Evans' trial. The carpenter confirmed that the timber used to conceal the bodies came from Christie's flat, which indicates that it was done after Evans had already left the premises. Mrs Christie's said she didn't notice anything unusual, even though the bodies were already hidden. Additionally, Christie's criminal history was not investigated, which could have cast doubt on his credibility. It was argued that it would be very unusual to have two killers in the same house, not knowing about each other, and killing their victims in exactly the same way. The circumstances surrounding Evans' confession and conflicting accounts make it difficult to determine the absolute truth. This case has been the subject of three judicial reviews, featured in at least three books, two films and a folk ballad, as well as occupying countless parliamentary debates and newspaper column inches. What is widely believed, though, is that Christy killed Beryl and Geraldine and Evans was wrongly accused and hanged. There are still those who believe Evans was guilty. I've seen it discussed on forums where it is still being debated today. Beryl's Brother Basil, who knew Evans well, believed Evans was guilty. Her other brother Peter, 
wrote a book about this as he was a teenager at the time, knew Evans and believed he was guilty. There are also criticisms that Peter's book was filled with inconsistencies. As you can see, this case has been a subject of discussion and controversy, and there are arguments both for and against Evans' guilt. In my opinion, I'm pretty sure Timothy Evans was innocent. Geraldine and Beryl were found together, wrapped in the same way as Christie's other victims. It is also mentioned in some reports that Ethel and Christie performed illegal abortions, which makes it more believable that Christie did offer to help with Beryl's abortion. So let's conclude this case. Timothy Evans and John Reginald Christie is a deeply troubling and tragic chapter in the history of British criminal justice system. This case shows how devastating the consequences can be with flawed investigations and flawed legal proceedings. John Reginald Christie, the true villain of the brutal crimes, show the depths of human depravity and the extent to which a serial killer can manipulate and deceive those around him. Even though it is such a tragic case, there were quite a few positive consequences that came from this case. The case had far-reaching implications beyond just their individual stories and actually played a crucial role in bringing about significant changes in the British legal system. It served as a catalyst for re-evaluating the use of the death penalty and highlighting the need for reforms to ensure justice is served without the risk of executing or convicting an innocent person. One of the most notable and powerful outcomes was the abolition of the death penalty for murder cases in 1965. The controversy and doubts surrounding Evans' trial, coupled with the subsequent inquiries, raise serious questions about the fairness of the justice system. It shows how a single case can spark change and prompt a re-examination of our legal systems. We have dedicated this video to the victims of John Christie. With all the controversy surrounding this case, the victims are often not given the same attention as the two main characters. What are your opinions of this case? Do you think Timothy Evans was innocent? Or do you think he was just a victim of John Christie's? Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm always looking for ways to improve my videos. I would appreciate your feedback. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share and subscribe. Remember, keep your loved ones close and stay safe. Until the next time.